Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is a portion of our Gospel reading where Jesus, in speaking to the crowds that, was fo that were following him, said to the people, Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Over the last couple of years, I've become a real fan of the TV show Shark Tank. Now, if you're not familiar with Shark Tank, the premise is entrepreneurs, people running their businesses, come into the presence of five or six investors who are called the Sharks. And they make their pitch about their business, hoping that they will get an investment deal from one or even more of the Sharks. Sometimes the businessman or woman walks away with a deal, other times they don't. It's edited down to smaller segments, but it's a pretty grueling ordeal for that person standing in front of five or six people defending their idea and their business and, and trying to persuade one of those folks to make an investment. A lot of times it's, I'll take a hundred, I need a hundred thousand dollars for a 10% equity stake and they'll talk about the valuation of the business and whether or not this business is, is investable and whether it has a future. Um, they'll negotiate it. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Some ideas are absolutely ludicrous. The one that comes to mind is the couple who loved cats and they invented this little rubber thing you can stick in your mouth that you can use to lick your cat. Yeah. I don't think anybody invested in that idea. I think they had a lot of fun making fun of those folks after that pitch. But other times, an idea gets traction and, and they'll get a, a good investment from the sharks. Well, I've learned some things. Never having gone to business school, Shark Tank has become my my MBA training, but I've learned some things from some of these sharks over the years. Mark Cuban, get ready to boo, he owns the Dallas Mavericks. We won't hold that against him. I've learned from him that there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a wantrepreneur. The entrepreneur is the person who has the dream for the business and also the drive. The wantrepreneur has the dream, but not the drive. And Mark Cuban will not invest with a wantrepreneur. I've also learned some things from Mr. Wonderful, as they call him, Kevin O'Leary. A lot of times the businesses that, that come out of Shark Tank are in their fledgling stage. And he will point out to the business person that right now you have a hobby, not a business. Might be a small cottage industry, it's just starting up. And it isn't something that has consumed that person completely. If a person is still maintaining their full-time job and kind of doing their business on the side, they'll get that phrase from Mr. Wonderful. You have a hobby not a business. If he invests in someone, he wants that person working 100% on the business so that he can make his money back. That's his job and his goal as an investor. So if someone is just kind of, of partially working on the business while they're doing their full-time job elsewhere, he wants nothing to do with them. I've also learned something from Lori Grenier, the queen of QVC. She quoted one time, an entrepreneur is someone willing to work 80 hours a week so they can avoid working 40 hours a week. 
The idea being that an entrepreneur is willing to work any amount of hours that they need to in order to work for themselves rather than to work 40 hours to make someone else successful. So I've learned those things on Shark Tank. I've also learned that sometimes a good idea will come into the tank and for whatever reason it won't get a deal. Consider this fellow. Jamie Simonoff. In 2013, he came into the Shark Tank with this idea for what he called DoorBot, a door robot, if you will. Four of the sharks wanted nothing to do with it. Some said very critical things about this idea not catching on. This idea would never sell on QVC. One shark, Kevin O'Leary, did offer a deal, but it was an unacceptable deal. Too much equity, no doubt, um, taken out of the company. Well, that did not deter our friend Jamie, even though DoorBot as a company was really on fumes and they, they desperately needed an injection of cash. Well, they didn't get it from the sharks and yet he persevered. He took their criticisms and the criticisms of others about his product to heart. He improved it. He, he, he had the drive to make his dream come true. And now DoorBot is what we call the ring doorbell which a year and a half ago sold to Amazon for 1.1 billion dollars. Billion with a B. He did pretty well for himself. Now, he didn't own all the equity in the company, so he didn't make a billion dollars. But still, the ring doorbell is now on, I don't know how many doors in America, I know it's on one, ours, we got it about a month ago, and I get notifications telling me that there's motion at my front door, or that there's someone ringing the doorbell at my house, and I can be sitting here at the office, and I can see who's dropping off a package or messing with our house. No one's messing with the house. As a gadget guy, I just kind of like looking, see the, see the live view, see what's going on in front of my house. But anyway, that fellow, Jamie Sinemoff, Sinemoff, had the drive to be rejected by the sharks and to keep pushing on until he made his dream come true and then was able to sell that dream to Amazon for over a billion dollars. So I've learned some things from the sharks. I've also learned something from someone that we all have learned from, our Lord Jesus Christ, who says some pretty intense words. Now, Jesus never taught classes in business school, but when he talks about discipleship, he talks very much like those sharks. Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Those are sobering words. But those of you who aren't willing to give up everything that you have cannot be my disciple. Jesus wants us to know that discipleship is challenging. Discipleship is challenging. Now, salvation, on the other hand, is easy. Our salvation on our part of the relationship, our part of, of the deal, is easy. Because our Lord Jesus did everything needed for our salvation. There is nothing left to do that did not get done on the cross of Calvary. And we can take great joy in that, to know that our sin has been atoned for through the blood of Jesus Christ, that, that we are declared righteous in God's sight 
because Jesus has bestowed upon us his own perfect righteousness. That there is a place waiting for us in eternity after we leave this world of sin and sorrow, there is a place of joy and bliss and beauty stored up for us because of Jesus. Through his death, we receive forgiveness. Through his resurrection from the grave, we receive the promise of our own resurrection and everlasting life. And we can rejoice in knowing that everything necessary for our salvation has already been done so that on our deathbed we will have no doubts about what happens when we take our last breath. When we close our eyes for the final time because the next breath we take will be in heaven. And when our eyes open, we will see our Lord Jesus as he truly is. Because of Jesus' dogged determination to deliver us from sin, death, and Satan, we have the assurance and the joy of salvation and everlasting life. Our salvation is a gift, not something we have to work in order to earn and not something we have to question whether we've earned it well enough. It is complete, total, 100% gift because of our Lord Jesus. So we take great comfort in that. But where our salvation is easy, Living as one who has been saved, living as a follower of Jesus, living as one of his disciples is anything but easy. And Jesus wants this crowd that is following after him to know what they're getting into. And so he says, if you come after me, and do not love me more than you love your parents, your spouse, your children, your siblings, even more than you love your own life. If I do not take first priority and precedence in your existence, you can't be my disciple. If you aren't willing to deny yourself and carry your cross, Jesus says, you can't be my disciple. And then he uses a couple of examples. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Before you start construction, don't you sit down and figure out how much this project is going to cost before you start building. Because if all you can do is build the foundation and then you run out of money, run out of funds and some shark won't invest in you, you become a laughing stock. You're ridiculed because, well, you started the project, but you couldn't finish it. Or suppose a king is contemplating going to war against another king, and he has 10,000 troops, and the other king has 20,000 troops, doesn't he sit down and figure out whether he can win a war with two-to-one odds against him? Maybe he can. Maybe his soldiers are skilled enough. Maybe his weapons are strong enough that he can do that even though he has less men. He can defeat a larger army. Or maybe he realizes, I can't do that. That's too much for my men to do. And if that's the case, well then he sends folks to say to the other king, let's work out terms of peace. But a wise king will count the cost 
A wise builder will count the cost before they get into something that is more than they can handle. And so Jesus says the same thing about discipleship. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus doesn't want people who treat their relationship with him as a hobby. He doesn't want entrepreneurs who dream of life with Jesus but aren't willing to live for Jesus. As we think about our mission here at Messiah, the same thing applies. Jesus wants us to doggedly embrace our neighbors with Jesus' unconditional love. If you talk to any of those entrepreneurs, including the sharks, they started with nothing except a dream and drive. And they were willing to put everything else in their lives on hold in order to achieve their dream. They had dogged determination. They had a single-mindedness where the business that they were trying to build was the only thing that they thought about. It was what they ate and breathed each and every day. And that's the kind of church that Jesus is looking for. That we as a congregation, doggedly, single-mindedly, sacrificially, embrace our neighbors with his unconditional love. That it's not just a hobby or something we do when it's convenient or something that we do half-heartedly. And it calls for sacrifice. It calls for the sacrifice of time. It calls for the sacrifice of rearranging our priorities as to what is truly important for us as a congregation each and every day. It calls for the sacrifice of effort because it takes effort to embrace our neighbors with Jesus' unconditional love. But Jesus has given us neighbors around us. He has given us an elementary school that, that has welcomed our partnership with them, which gives us the opportunity to connect with kids, many of whom do not know who Jesus is, and none of whom are being taught about Jesus in their school. For us to be able to be there as a presence. For us to be able to bring Gabriel and let them know he has a Bible verse and that he comes from a church that is connected to their neighborhood. That's a huge opportunity for us. And it requires sacrifice to, to capitalize on that opportunity, if you will. It might even call as we are doggedly and single-mindedly focused on embracing our neighbors with Jesus' unconditional love, it might even call for us to sacrifice our reputation. Believe it or not, there are some folks in our church body who think that this whole dog ministry is inappropriate. And that churches that are are using dogs to help with ministry, are, are going about it the wrong way. There are congregations or individuals who might look at us for having a dog as going about things the wrong way. They might call our reputation into question as a result. Maybe we have to sacrifice our reputation when it comes to the folks that we try to reach. Maybe it's folks who aren't like us, who don't believe what we believe, who don't live the lives that we live. 
And if we start reaching out to those folks, whether they be politicians or prostitutes, well, maybe people will look at us and question why we're doing that. You know, Jesus, in his dogged determination to seek and to save the lost, didn't care about his reputation. In fact, one of the criticisms that he got was this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's what the religious folks said about Jesus. And Jesus said, yeah, but those are the folks who need me. The folks who realize that they are sinners. And yes, I will welcome them and I will eat with them. And I will love them. And I will bring them the good news of salvation. So maybe as a congregation, there are those times when we are called to do the same thing. Regardless of what other people might think, we look at the opportunities that the Lord sets before us. Jesus was single-minded in his determination to redeem you. So single-minded that he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem where he knew that he would suffer and die. His disciples didn't think that was a good idea, but Jesus knew that's what had to be done. Paul, when he goes to Corinth, a place which was known as, as a very cosmopolitan city, with a lot of people coming there from different parts of the Roman Empire, a place where there were very learned people and very wealthy people, Paul comes in great humility. And as he said in 1 Corinthians 2, I didn't come with eloquent speech or great wisdom, but I had this one single-minded determination to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what Paul was focused on. That whoever he encountered would hear about Jesus, the crucified one. We are called to Jesus' mission to embrace our neighbors with his unconditional love. And Jesus doesn't want it to be treated like a hobby. He doesn't want it to be done by entrepreneurs. He wants it to be a single-minded focus for our congregation. Just as he was single-minded in giving all that he had in order to redeem you, God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.